Hello YouTube and welcome to the first in my scope tutorial series. Um, this video, I'll say, I'll just put this out there now. This video is kindly sponsored by Rigol, who are lending me this awesome oscilloscope. Okay, and um, this particular model, I'll be demonstrating the functions you can use on this, but um, that will be much later on. In the beginning, I'm going to go over general concepts that will apply to any um, oscilloscope and any digital score, digital storage oscilloscope. Okay. Um, although this model, while um, a little on the pricey side, is actually quite a good, uh, it's quite a good value for money for a serious hobbyist. It's not overpriced like some of the scopes by Keysight uh, for the functions you get. I mean, this is a four-channel, um, 100 megahertz scope with one giga samples per second. It's actually quite nice. Um, so let me get down to business. So before we can do anything, we have to go over some safety things. So, you know, it's the first rule of anything, right? So the first thing is your scope must be grounded, okay? So this is more of a concern for people living in Japan, really. Um, so this is, th I've got a three pin power cord here, okay? Do not defeat this using a, a three to two pin adapter in the US or Japan, okay? Don't do that, or in any other country where you have that possibility. Your scope needs to be grounded to work properly, um, and for safety as well. It should always be grounded. It's a piece of bench gear, and generally speaking, most electrical bench gear, such including some bench multimeters, surprisingly, um, are actually grounded and require a ground. Okay, even though the case is plastic. Okay, so it's critical you have a working ground, and in Japan that can be a problem. But um, if it's a problem for you, please check out my um, Zipless in Japan series where I do explain how you can get a ground uh, into your room if you don't have one um, using tricks such as running a wire from your air conditioner, for example. They're, they're perfectly safe tricks if you um, spend some time doing it properly. Oh, and enjoy the background sound of uh, what we call semi or cicadas. <laughs> Um, it's the middle of summer, they've all come out, they've come out in, in force. Hopefully it's not ruining the audio too much. So make sure you've got working ground before we start. Okay. Alright, so um, first of all the most obvious question, what is an oscilloscope? Well it's a device that shows voltage over time, so you can view a signal over time, whereas with a multimeter, you're, you're, it's very slow updating, as you probably noticed, you know, even a decent multimeter might update 10 times per second at best. Um, but it doesn't really show you anything if you've got a signal. So imagine you've got a sine wave, and you know I'll be showing you a signal in a minute using the built-in test point. But if you've got a signal um, you want to look at, you can't look at it with a multimeter, and, okay? Unless it's an extremely so extremely slow signal, like I don't know, um, a 0.1 hertz square wave or something, and then you reverse it on a uh, on a multimeter or um, a logic probe. But a multimeter. Um, cannot give you, cannot really tell you much about signals, especially when you, you're getting to fast digital electronics. Um, I used this thing to debug my um, fan pulse with modulation, I used it to debug my I2C implementation that didn't work. I was doing software on I2C and it just didn't work. You try doing that with a multimeter, you can't do that, you need an oscilloscope. So, um, the most basic way, I'm, I'm only going to cover the most basics in this first. Uh, video and we'll take it from there. So here you have your, you know, you have your trace. Currently it's just displaying a straight line because nothing's plugged in, okay? Um, the horizontal axis is time, the vertical axis is voltage, okay? And down here, let me get you a zoom so you can see the screen nicely. So down here it's currently saying one volts per division. Now what this means is um, on the screen here is divided into a grid or graticule and each square is one volt. So if this wave was going up, went up by one square, it would be one volt. Okay. Um, anything above, anything above the, the middle is positive voltage, anything below is a negative voltage. Okay. Um, so the first thing you want to do when you get your scope um, and you unbox it before you do anything else is you want to um, you want to connect the probe to a test point which is on the front of the machine here. Um, even really cheap scopes have it, but uh, you know, all, seriously, all scopes have this. So you want to connect your probe to your test point here, and you want to adjust, and you want to adjust the probe. So I'll show you how to do that. So get your probe, okay, 
and they, they always use these BNC connectors on decent scopes. Um, if you've got a, if you've got a mini scope, it might have a mini BNC of some some kind or something like an uh, a mini SMA type connector or something. But decent scopes use proper BNC connectors. So just twist and lock, and in we go. Okay. Now you can see it's picking up some noise. Okay, that's normal because it's it's not connected to anything, right? Um, your basic controls in your scope are your time base. Okay, this control here does a time base, which is just how quickly it will sample the signal. Okay, so as you can see, if I if I speed up the time base, you know it's crazy now. But if I slide right down, right, you can see it's actually so slow now. Look at that. You saw it. You can see it refreshing. Okay, you see you've got your time base, and you've also got your um, a simple way of thinking of this is you can think of this as like an amp an amplification dial or how many volts per division. So if you look at this number down here, I'm now doing 100 millivolts per division. So this sine wave signal, well, it's not really a proper sine wave, but this is actually mains hum that's coming in here, um, is actually um, has a peak to peak of just over 130 millivolts per division. So 130 millivolts per per wave. If you look at that, right. And the frequency, because this scope's quite a nice one, it will show you the frequency, is 50 hertz, roughly. And where am I? Well, I'm in the 50 hertz region of Japan, so it's picking up ambient noise. Okay? So what you want to do, okay, you need to do some pro compensation before you do anything else with your scope. And this will be in the instructions for your scope, but I'll cover it quickly. So the first thing you need to do, and um, yes, I'm covering it for this particular model, but it will apply to most scopes. You need to find out how to choose what type your probe type here okay now on this scope it's easy um, so let's say you've, you've got two channels enabled you select the channel you want to muck around with right by pressing the channel button once and then here where it says probe 10x you press this okay and then you can choose okay now with your standard probes you'll get 1x you'll get these normally you'll get these probes that do 1x or 10x so you want to have it set to 10x generally unless you're measuring a very weak signal so have it set to 10x. Make sure this is also 10x. Now on this particular model, um, you you have you have nice um, these nice controls here that are really easy to use to set it. So you know just turn and click. Okay, so I'm done with that. I'll turn off channel two. So I'm not using it. Okay, so channel one is set correctly. Okay, um, coupling is interesting. Now coupling. Um, it will be better demonstrated with a circuit schematic and some other information. But basically. If you've got a coupling set to DC, it would you're just measuring a standard DC signal, and that's probably what you'll use most of the time. But AC coupling is kind of like putting a capacitor in series with the probe. So AC coupling is useful for measuring the ripple of a power supply, for example, and I'll demonstrate these concepts in later videos. But for calibrating your oscilloscope, just leave it set to DC coupling, um, and everything else, you know, I've got everything else is just kind of default. You know, I haven't got any special settings here. So what you do is you clip your ground lead onto the ground terminal there's, there's always a ground post on the scope okay and you clip your signal uh, point there okay and you can see there there's a wave on the screen now um, I just noticed you, you couldn't see me clip that but the test points on this particular scope are here um, let me unplug that so you can see it alright just here on the side there and they're marked okay and by default you get these hook clips, okay? That's standard. So we've got our signal now. One thing you can do to get your full frame so you can see every button, there we go, that will help I think. Um, one thing you can do is there's an auto button. Uh, most scopes will have this. So if you just press auto, it will try and do its best to guess what type of signal what type of uh, settings to use for the signal that you're feeding in. And there we go, it's done it's done a reasonable job there. We've got a square wave as you can see there, okay? Um, so if you've messed up your settings, like if you've been twiddling these and you've, in, and you've made it really ridiculous and I don't know, let's say you, it's ridiculous like that and you don't know what's going on, you can just hit auto and give it some time to think about it and it will put, it will get it back to sanity, shall we say, right? Um, I'll talk about triggering later as well because obviously um, if you've got a, a signal that's constantly running how, why is the scope showing this nice static image instead of something that's jumbled up? If you've got an old analog oscilloscope, you'll see just like a, it, it without triggering, right? Some of these really old vacuum 
uh, I had one in England actually for a short while. You know, it had vacuum tubes in it or valves as we call them in England, and it had no triggering or anything. You would just see a mess on the screen at this point. That's, okay. Um, uh, basically, triggering tell, makes it, makes it so the scope will always start at the same point when it's displaying the signal. Okay, I'll go into depth in this in another video. Okay, but for the purposes of this, we're just getting set up. So you can just hit auto, and there you go. And currently, you can see here it's selected 500 millivolts per division. We've got a frequency of one kilohertz on this square wave here, and we're tr we're triggering. Um, our trigger point is here. I'll ex again, I'll explain this later. It's all automatic right now. All right. Now, what you need to do to compensate the probe because the probes have capacitance and it can cause problems at high frequencies and stuff. Your probes will always come with with a kind of plastic screwdriver type tool, and there will be an adjustment on them. So, if I just unplug this, there will be an adjustment hole somewhere for compensating the probe. Okay. And on this one, it's here, and you have to use, and you use this little plastic thing. So, let me show you what I mean. What, what happens if you don't compensate the probe? So, if I zoom in, okay, you see that square wave there, right? That's fairly clean, isn't it? Right. Let me start fiddling with the adjustment, okay? Let me zoom out a bit so you can get to see better what's going on. See that? Right. So what, the, what you need to do is you need to get it so that the square wave looks as clean as possible, as straight as possible, okay? You'll never get it 100% perfect, so when you zoom in, you know, you're going to see a little bit of ramp up there, okay? But, you know, that's also, that could be the signal generator inside the, inside the scope, yeah? So you want to get it so it looks very clean like that, without any overshoot and undershoot, right? And when you zoom out, it should look like a, quite a nice, stable square wave, right? You don't want it looking like that looking like that. So turn it until you can get it as good as you can. Right? And I'd say that's good enough. All right? So you need to compensate your probe. That's the first thing you need to do. And you need to do it for every probe. Okay? And uh, some people might even recommend doing it for every channel. So, if, so when you get your probes, they come with these coloured rings generally. Okay? Um, I've, most scope, pretty much, pretty much every scope brand I've seen does this. You get these coloured rings and you can match them to the channels. So what I recommend doing is matching your probes to your channels and leaving them there. Compensate all of them and leave them in the channels. Because each channel might have slight variances in its signal processing circuitry that causes the compensation to be different, if that makes sense. So um, compensate each probe individually. And if you change channel, like if I now take this out of channel 1 and stick it in channel 3, for example, right, and then turn on channel 3. On the scope it's easy. You just press and channel that's not illuminated and there you go, the channel's on. And you c if I then press channel 1, the first time I press it, it just changes to, to changing the settings for channel 1 so I can change uh, my coupling. But if I press it again, it will turn off channel 1. All right? Um, so let's say this probe was now going to be for channel 3. Well, I should really recompensate the probe if, I c if, I'm, make if I'm making really accurate measurements. Um, you know, I can press auto again. And You'll notice, even though I haven't done anything clever, um, it's already compensated for channel th for channel three. It's you know it's clean enough, right? Generally, that's generally you'll find that's the case. Okay, um, you generally won't need to do that, but it's just good practice in my opinion. So let me just set the, put things back to normal. Okay, and there are some other um, nice settings on this thing. This thing is packed with features. This thing has computer control over USB. Um, this thing can export images, it can print images, there's built-in help screens um, like this, you know, and, and you can get help on pretty much anything. It's, it's all built into the, to the machine. Um, but, you know, for the purpose of this, again, this is just the first video, I'm just getting you, on the, I'm getting you in on the basics. So once your probes are compensated, you want to make some measurements. Now, with your probe, you've, you've always got this ground clip lead, um, as well as the probe tip. Now, the probe tips... Um, by default, they're these uh, clipper. They're like I like to call these nippers, although they don't nip any. You know what I mean? They're like little, they're like tiny hooks. Yeah, you can pull that off if you want to to get a finer, an even finer tip, which is usually if you're probing a small, a small package. And in fact, in the box, you'll find okay, they 
you, you usually get these tiny springs as well and what you do with these is if you put that you can actually put this around the edge of the, of the probe to, act to give you another um, ground so instead of having to like go for it because this distance here between your ground lead and the tip here can cause problems when you're measuring high frequency signals so you can use this tiny spring thing to measure to use a ground point right next to where you're measuring but that's for specialist use really when you're measuring really high frequency signals for standard use this is absolutely fine now I do recommend having a look at Dave Jones's video about how not to blow up your oscilloscope I'll put, it, I'll put a link into the video description but suffice to say this lead is referenced to mains earth so if you're measuring a battery powered circuit um, you won't have any problems whatsoever okay you just click you can click this any way you want you can click this to negative voltage on the battery and then measure anywhere on the circuit you can click this to positive voltage on the battery and measure anywhere on the circuit and you'll just get n negative readings right the readings will be upside down okay but let's imagine you're measuring uh, let's imagine you've got a TV apart and you're, you're testing you know, you're probing around the power supply and you've got this and you clip this to live like mains live well, bang! Right, like literally, this lead will, this lead may explode um, and blow, blow in half. You might, you might, you might blow up a channel on the scope. That's an expensive thing to have repaired. Um, you know, your your breaker might go if you're lucky. But um, I know a friend who blew up a channel on his scope by doing that. <laughs> so you have to be careful you clip this this lead if you're measuring um, live circuits that are actually connected to the mains and USB circuits as well. Um, I'll make a video that goes into detail if people want to, want to know, but uh, Dave Jones has a very good video, I'll link to it, and if people still want me to cover it, I'll cover it. But um, to keep it really simple, if it's battery powered, go, go right ahead, clip this thing anywhere you want, as long as it's battery powered and not plugged in for anything else. If it's connected via a DC power supply that uses a two pin plug, okay, or a three pin plug where the third pin is just plastic like it's it's an unused the earth pin does nothing a good example of that is anything sold in england you know the earth pin has to be present for the shutters to open otherwise the device can't be plugged in but you'll find the third pin is usually plastic sometimes it's metal to, re to make it stronger but it does nothing if it's a completely isolated dc power supply again feel free to, to connect this probe any way you want on the circuit and you won't have a problem um, but if it's USB, like if you're probing something that's powered by USB, you have to be careful again because, and this is why I said you need to ground the scope carefully. Um, if this scope isn't grounded properly, let's let, let's uh, a good example would be at some American homes where um, you can sometimes even in the same room if you've got a bad wiring job, you've got sockets on different phases and all kinds of nonsense in the same room, right? Let's imagine for a second that my computer had a decent, had a really good ground. And this had a poor ground, like a, like a ground that was really high resistance or something, right? And I had a USB device, and I then clipped this ground lead to it. As soon as as soon as I do that, um, I'm trying to I'm connecting the two grounds together, right? What I've done is because the scope has a poor ground connection and the PC has a good ground connection, that can cause some issues. Okay, um, so you've got to be careful about things like that. So. If you're probing a USB device, personally what I recommend and what I do myself, this scope is running from the same power strip as all the UPS gear that runs my computer. So everything's on the same ground, everything has the same ground reference. So I'm okay to probe USB stuff as long as this ground lead always goes to ground. Right? So if I connect this to plus five volts on the USB by accident, well, things aren't going to be happy, you know. Uh, it's not going to go bang, but um, there's a couple of things that will happen depending on your PC. Your PC, it, well it might go bang if you've got a really poor motherboard, a really poor power supply in the PC, there's no protection. But usually what, ha what will happen is the USB port will shut down uh, protecting it, because basically you've shorted it out to ground, right? you shorted out the po positive 5 volt supply to ground on your USB, on your USB bus. And the reason I'm mentioning USB devices so much is because of the Arduino projects I'm going to be covering on this channel. Um, and you might be tempted, ah, oh, I can just be, you know, I can just start probing away, or be careful, make sure your ground is connected to ground if you're probing a live USB circuit that's plugged into USB, alright? And if you're, if you're not sure, um, one thing you can do with the real Arduino is, is they, have two, they have two power supplies, you've got USB and a DC barrel jack. So what you can do is, after flashing the code to the Arduino, unplug it from USB, power it with a DC isolated power supply, Okay, so just a standard, you know, 12 volt power supply that's isolated, 
and then probe away and you're less likely to make a mistake. You don't want to blow up, blow up one of the channels in your scope, okay? It's an expensive repair. You don't want to, you don't want to go there, okay? So, you know, once you've got your probe all, all calibrated um, and you please check out Dave Jones's video. Um, in my next video, I know this is a bit of a short one, okay? In my next video, I'll go over how to actually um, use this thing properly. So, um, you know, when you would use various coupling modes and I might even show you some of the other it, it further on obviously I'll show you some of the other fun things you can do with this with this scope such as XY mode which is something that those of you who use an analog scope or have seen one used might recognize you know when you get like nice swirly patterns drawn on the screen um, that's actually XY mode and um, it can be useful for certain things alright so until I know this is a short video but until next time um, Stay safe, you know, if you're playing with your scope, please look at Dave Jones' video, okay? Let me know if you need a simpler version of his video that's condensed into like five minutes and I'll do one with a diagram showing you where, when and when it isn't safe to connect, you know, where it's safe to get your ground lead and when and when you shouldn't connect it to certain things, alright? And, you know, um, until next time, um, thanks for watching. Sorry it's short, but this is just a really quick introduction, and um, it shouldn't be too long until the next part, so see you soon YouTube.